Good afternoon. My name is Kathy Schultz, and I am the Water Education Specialist with the California Department of Water Resources, and I would like to welcome you to Water Wednesdays. The mission of the California Department of Water Resources is to sustainably manage the water resources of California in cooperation with other agencies to benefit the state's people and protect, restore, and enhance the natural and human environments. And if you've joined us for previous Water Wednesdays, you know that there's a lot of different things that we do. We do biological monitoring in the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. We manage reservoirs and help ensure water deliveries. But another thing that we focus on is reducing flood risk. In fact, DWR has a division specifically dedicated to flood risk reduction and flood management. And our speaker today, George Qualley, was chief of that division, not once, but twice during his long and impressive career with DWR. So we've, we're really lucky to have him with us here today. You know, floods don't necessarily get as much attention as droughts, especially droughts like the one that we had between 2011 and 2015. That was a statewide drought that impacted people's lives for months and months on end. Um, or fires, like we're experiencing throughout California right now, um, which are so visual and we're all you know, sensing the smoke. But floods, and part of the reason I think for that is, is floods tend to be somewhat localized. But flooding is a regular occurrence in California. And sometimes it's very local and sometimes it's statewide. Sometimes it can actually, the floods can actually span multiple states. Um, and if you look up on the internet, if you look up California floods, you'll see that one of the first major recorded floods happened here in Sacramento in 1850, not long after gold miners began pouring into the state. And two years later, Sacramento flooded again. Um, this is a picture of what downtown Sacramento looked like. And the story is that Governor Leland Stanford had to row from the second story of his home to the Capitol to attend his own inauguration. So we can have some pretty big floods. And you know, they don't just happen in Sacramento. Here in Sacramento, we're at the confluence of two rivers, but which helps. But there's large notable floods that have occurred in Los Angeles, along the Russian River. Um, if you went camping or visited Yosemite before 1997, you might remember that there were campgrounds, uh, more campgrounds in the valley. Floods took those out and changed how we visit the park. So there's lots of different floods that have happened in California. Uh, the first one I remember was in 1986, the one that impacted me when I was growing up. Um, and then I grew up hearing family stories about the floods of 1955 and the Christmas flood of 1964. Um, and so George is here today to tell us a little bit about what we've done, so about a little more about some of these historic floods and what things that we've done in the Sacramento Valley to protect people and their homes. Because as soon as they had large populations of people in California living by the rivers, 1850s, we started trying to hold those floodwaters back. And so George is going to be sharing a little bit of that history with us today. Before I turn things over to him, I just want to go over a few logistics for using Zoom. If you've joined us on Zoom today, you are going to be able to ask George questions. So you simply have to go down to the bottom of your screen and click on the chat icon, this little uh, word bubble above the word chat, and you can post your questions and I will get to as many of them as I can um, after George's presentation. Uh, if you already have your closed captions on automatically but you don't wanna see them, you can just go a few buttons over and click on CC for closed caption, that'll turn them off. Alternatively, if you like to read along, um, the closed captions are there for you to turn on if you're joining us on YouTube, you um, won't be able to ask us questions, but uh, you'll be able to get a really great presentation from George. And so I think that covers how to use Zoom. And I'm going to turn things over. Welcome, George. Thanks for, for being with us here today. Hi. I'm very glad to be here on the last day of the 2020 water year. It is. Uh, give you a little bit of background about myself. I uh, graduated from North Dakota State University in 1969 with a civil engineering degree. And I couldn't wait to get uh, out of the snow and cold and head out to sunny California. And I spent the first six years of my career working on design of highways and bridges. And then I switched over to Department of Water Resources and I've been uh, in the water uh, ever since and, and really enjoyed it. 
I felt honored to be head of the Division of Flood Management for 13 years and I retired in 2009, but I continue to work about half time as a retired annuitant. We've got a lot of uh, important things going on and I'm happy to be a part of it. So let's uh, move ahead with the presentation. If I can figure out the Zoom, I'm definitely a boomer, but I guess now I'm a Zoomer. Ah, okay. And we'll move immediately to slide number two. Over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna do my best to cover 170 years of flood history, starting with what the Sacramento Valley and watershed looked like at the time of the gold rush. I'm gonna go through how the Sacramento River Flood Control Project came to be, how it works, and when the key features were built. I'll also talk about the later construction of major multi-purpose reservoirs which were built to provide water supply and recreation. And they also included dedicated flood storage, which greatly improved the effectiveness of the levee and bypass system. I'll talk a bit about how flood planning has evolved from single purpose flood control back in the days and to multi-benefit over the decades. Then I'll describe how big storms are generated by atmospheric rivers and talk about the climate change challenge going into the future. So let's start this flood history by taking a bird's eye view of the Sacramento Valley at the time of the gold rush, which was uh, the time when California became the 31st state in 1850. At that time, much of the Sacramento and San Joaquin River Valleys, which together we refer to as California's Central Valley, were considered to be swamp and overflow lands. So you can see the caption on the picture here. And you can follow the Sacramento River winding its way through the valley and joined by the three tributary rivers, uh, the, the major ones, the Feather River, the Yuba River, and the American River, which joins the Sacramento River at, uh, at the town of Sacramento, and then on down. So that's how it looked uh, in 1850. There was uh, not much built at that time. So back in 1917, some smart person somehow measured that there was uh, over 2,000 square miles of natural flood basins in the Sacramento Valley. And just to give you a scale on this map, uh, we got the city of Chico up here, and the, the, it's about a 90 mile drive from Chico to Sacramento, and about another 45, 45 mile drive to Rio Vista down at the bottom end. So that's about 135 miles if you were to drive this distance. If you were to float in a canoe from where the levees start up at uh, Ord Bend, which you'll see on another slide, you'd be floating about 190 some miles because uh, river mile zero of the Sacramento River Flood Control Project is down here at Collinsville and it's about river mile 195 up at Ord Bend. So the, the curves in the river add, add a lot of distance. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is uh, we have superimposed the Sutter Bypass and the Yola Bypass onto this picture here. So you can see that uh, the, the Sutter by those two bypasses, uh, it's, uh, they were built in the low points of these existing natural basins, so they, they follow the natural uh, flow of the land. One main point of this slide that I want you to remember is that no matter what structures or whatever else that we human beings have built over the years to control floods, as we thought, or whatever we do to manage floodwaters, Mother Nature will always seek to return this valley to these natural flood basins. You may have heard in the news about something called an arc storm, which is a storm so big that hardly anybody can imagine it. Well, it's not very likely to have something like that, but there's always a big storm out there that, that could surprise us. So we need, need to be wary of that. There have been a lot of big flood years over the last 170 years, and many more over previous centuries when only Native Americans were here to observe them. The Great Flood of 1862 was a big deal because the entire Central Valley was transformed into an inland sea. Uh, historian Robert Kelly uh, used that concept for the title of his book, Battling the Inland Sea. Although the 1862 flood was clearly historic, it was not possible at the time to accurately measure just how big it was in terms of river flows. However, by 1907, enough river gauges were in place to measure the magnitude of flows past the latitude of Sacramento at 600,000 cubic feet per second. Now, a basketball has a volume of about one cubic foot, so just picture 600,000 basketballs flowing past Sacramento every second. When a similar sized flood occurred in 1909, it was decided to size the bypass plant at 600,000 cubic feet per second, or basketballs per second if you prefer, past Sacramento. 
Before I go to my slide depicting the major features of the Sacramento River Flood Control Project, I want to explain to you what an overflow weir is, what it looks like in the dry, and how it functions in the wet during high water. In the first picture, I'm standing at Molten Weir in April 2018, which was a pretty dry year. Molten Weir is the northernmost of the three passive Sacramento overflow weirs, Calusa and Tisdale are the other two. It's a concrete structure that, uh, this is actually the weir itself, uh, with a rounded OG uh, shape, and uh, we'll talk, I'll mention that later as well. So it makes for a real nice flow. Um, and it allows flood flows to pass over the top of the weir and out of the Sacramento River, which comes in from this direction, and it flows out into the uh, Ute Basin when the stage in the river is high enough for the water to flow over the weir. You'll see a stilling basin here, which is to the water, a lot of energy where the water drops down, so it has to keep eroding from undercutting the weir. Now this picture was taken during the Great Flood of 1997 with molten weir flowing at near the design flow of 40,000 basketballs per second. But it's, a, it's a really a, a beautiful uh, scene to see molten weir flowing. And here's a more close-up view. Uh, this was taken in February 2017, another high water year. As an engineer, I've always found molten weir to be a beautiful sight from the ground or the air, with the water flowing smoothly over the rounded OG-shaped surface. Here are some other views of Molten Weir. Uh, this first photo here was also taken in 2018, and in the foreground shows the river stage measuring structure. The vertical pipe on the left is what we call a stilling well, and contains a float that rides up and down on the stage of the river, and electronic sensors that transmit the real-time stage of the Sacramento River at Molten Weir back to DWR's Flood Operations Center in Sacramento. Uh, through calculations uh, made by use of a rating curve, because this, this river stage reading will tell us how deep the water is flowing over molten weir, we can calculate the magnitude of flow over the weir in real time as it is happening. Now this picture here, this was uh, taken in 2017. This shows flow over molten weir into the Butte Basin overflow area. You see three distinct channels and it takes it into the Butte Basin. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Butte Basin uh, in a later slide. Okay, for this slide, I'm gonna be making liberal use of the laser pointer, pointer to show major features and operations of the flood control project. Uh, and I'll please follow along with me as I point out key features of the project and, and, and other information. But I'm gonna start by just kind of walking, walking the flow through the system. So up here at Ord Bend, that's where the levee starts. You know, from, from this point all the way up to uh, Shasta Dam, there are, there are no levees on the Sacramento River. So at Ordbin, we, we start with, uh, with levees. And, uh, and this is what I mentioned earlier, this is about uh, river mile 190 something. And at this point, the design of the Sacramento, Sacramento River Flood Control Project is about 300,000 cubic feet per second. And this, these levees are designed to carry about a levee channel. The Sacramento River is designed to carry about 150,000 cubic feet per second. So whatever is in excess of 150,000 gets diverted into the Butte Basin overflow area, but uh, some other structures that are you know, flood relief structures that are in place. Okay, so let's follow the water down here in Sacramento River. So we get to Molten Weir, and we've still got a capacity of 150. Well, we dump about 100, about 40,000 CFS out of Molten Weir. We dump about 60,000 out of Calusa Weir, and maybe 25,000 if we're lucky at Tisdale Weir. And so the river channel is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So by the time we get down here to Fremont Weir, the Sacramento River is only carrying about 30,000 cubic feet per second. But we got a bunch of water coming down that's kind of trickled through the Butte Basin. So the thing about the Butte Basin, we call this transitory storage, and it slows the water down. So it, it'll store up to about a half a million uh, acre feet, uh, not permanently, but it slows it down enough to uh, allow, allow the system to pass the flow easier. And so it dumps out in the Sutter Basin, and we pick up flows, of course, from the Feather River and the Yuba River. And when we get to Fremont Weir, that's where the water actually passes over the Sacramento Weir and from the Sutter Bypass into the Yellow Bypass and continues down the Yellow Bypass. Uh, and the capacities here at Sacramento, we've got a capacity of about 100,000 in the river, 500,000 in the Yellow Bypass. So that's the 600,000 design flow at the latitude of Sacramento. That carries the water all the way down here to, to where we go through the, uh, what's called the big cut. Um, and here's where we get into some of the history. And it gets, we get into 
okay, what, kind of, what was the sequence where the project was built? Because it took 50 years to build it. Well, the first thing they needed to do is to get uh, dirt out of the way here because it was, it was blocked from entering into the Sacramento River and into the Delta. They needed to remove a lot of dirt. It took them about 10 years to do it from 1913 to 1924. They, they moved about as much uh, earth as was uh, excavated to build the Panama Canal. So that was done in 1924. And also in 1924, not by coincidence, the Fremont Weir was built because you don't want to build the Fremont Weir to carry more water through down into the Yellow Bypass until you can get rid of that water at the downstream end of the Yellow Bypass. And another key feature, we have the American River coming in from the side into Sacramento, but the flows in the American River are about the same as what the downstream flows are in the Sacramento River. So what are you going to do? Well, City of Sacramento built the Sacramento Weir in 1960, 1916, 1917 to carry that water into the, the Yolo Bypass. So that's another major feature. These weirs here were built in the 30s. They're probably WPA projects, I would guess. And the levees of the Center Bypass and the Yolo Bypass, there was, they, they started on in the 20s and most of the work was done in the 30s and 40s. And by the time you got to the middle 50s, uh, most, most of the originally authorized project was essentially done. And remember, the, the original Sacramento River Flood Control Project authorized in, in 1917 did not include uh, reservoirs. Uh, they came later. Okay, these three slides of the Sacramento Weir were all taken in February 2017 during high water. On this one, you'll see the CHB Academy uh, high-speed training track in the foreground. I was fortunate enough to do ride-alongs twice on that, and I'll tell you what, that's a lot of fun. Uh, this is also the title slide uh, for this presentation, so you saw this before, and it shows the water uh, going through the Sacramento Weir and through Sacramento Bypass and out to uh, the, the Yola Bypass. Now, DWR is uh, currently, in the, and the Central Valley Flood Protection Board, are currently working with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Sacramento Area Flood Control Agency to widen the Sacramento Weir by about 1,500 feet. It's going to widen this way. And uh, so it'll carry more flow, uh, which allows us then to send more flow down the American River, uh, which increases the flood protection for Sacramento. So that uh, that work is uh, should be going to uh, parts of it are going to be going to construction uh, within the next uh, year or two. Now this uh, photo here, uh, this is my uh, uh, green screen photo. And uh, what's of note here is that the American River comes into Sacramento about in here, and that's about two miles from here to where it flows out of the Sacramento Weir. And so the water from the American River is actually pushing upstream in the Sacramento uh, River to get out uh, uh, the Sacramento Weir. Now any levied river system, no matter how diligent the maintaining agencies may be, sometimes experience levee failures. Now the upper picture shows a Feather River uh, levee near Arboga that failed on uh, January 2nd, 1997, about in this area here. Now, the lower picture shows a set of bypass levee just upstream of Tisdale Weir. You see Tisdale Weir here and the, and the bypass here. So uh, the bypass levee failed on January 4th, 1997. And neither one of these levees were overtopped. Both failures were attributed to soil conditions that allowed flood water to seep under the foundation and, and collapse the levee. Now these photos were taken by me from a helicopter in the San Joaquin River Valley in January 1997. This large photo shows how elevation of homes in flood prone areas can help the homes survive even if the levee breaks. Uh, this was pretty astonishing when we, when we came upon this scene. Uh, this photo here uh, illustrates how a ring levee that's only a few feet high can protect a farmstead in a broad, flat floodplain. And in fact, on my home farm in North Dakota, my nephew built a ring levee around the farm. Uh, it was only about four feet high, and he was able to do it with his own equipment, and that's protected the farm from 500-year floods over the years. Now this, is, uh, uh, this shows the broad scope of flooding from the San Joaquin River. Uh, this photo is actually used as a cover illustration for a reprinting of that Battle in the Inland Sea book by Robert Kelly. Uh, our director, David Kennedy, wrote a foreword uh, to that book after the historic 1997 flood. 
Now, this photo was taken near Lathrop during the 1997 flood. I, I didn't take this particular picture, but I flew over this at the time, and that was, uh, that was pretty astonishing, too. Now, DWR flood fires in the field had anticipated the possibility of active erosion collapsing this embankment. And so we made repeated calls from the DWR flood center to try to reach a railroad decision maker. It was finally successful in getting a hold of somebody at the railroad to reluctantly cancel our scheduled runs on this mainline track. They were not at all happy at the time of doing that, but they were really happy the next day when they didn't have to fish a train out of the drink. So far today, I've described how the Sacramento River Flood Control Project was formulated in the 1910 Jackson Plan, authorized by Congress in 1917, largely completed by the mid 50s and suffered major floods in 1955, 64, 86, and 97. In the wake of Hurricane Katrina in 2004, California voters passed two initiatives in 2006, Propositions 1E and 84, that provided almost $6 billion to fund flood risk management programs and projects and programs. And that funding has been combined with local and federal funding to build several major projects to increase flood protection in major urban areas. Projects include Folsom Dam and spillway upgrades, uh, levee setbacks on the Feather and Bear Rivers, and that was also an opportunity to do multi-benefit multi because the levee setbacks not only provided additional flood, flood protection by lowering the stage of the river, but uh, it allowed uh, planting you know, restoration uh, to be put in any restoration plantings to be put in the setback area. I've also made urban levee improvements in, in Sacramento and, and West Sacramento, Marysville, uh, Yuba City, and also planning for improvements in the Stockton area and in the Woodland area. We're on the home stretch here. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on atmospheric rivers because the next two speakers in this Water Wednesday series are gonna be covering this subject. Uh, I wanna say just enough about ARs as background for describing how climate change is likely the biggest challenge for flood planners in the Central Valley. Our atmospheric river is the fancy scientific term for big storms, which produce lots of rain and snow. ARs are about 300 miles wide, and they pick up tropical moisture near Hawaii, which is why atmospheric rivers are also referred to as the Pineapple Express. ARs transport concentrated water vapor for thousands of miles, you know, coming over from, from Hawaii, until they hit the coastline. And then as the water vapor lifts over mountains, it, it cools and condenses. Now, it's just, so it goes over the coast range here, and that'll dump a lot more water in the coastal areas and, and uh, like Russian River in that area. And then it gets into the valley, and then it goes up the Sierras, where it really uh, goes up in, in elevation. Now, as the water vapor lifts over the mountains, it cools and condenses. And this phenomenon is known as orographic effect. Remember that term, you might win a trivia contest with it someday. And the water, uh, the water vapor cools and condenses, falling as rain or snow, depending on. Uh, whether it's uh, a, a warm warm storm or a, or a colder storm. Now this is how an atmospheric river looks on a weather model and would look very similar on a satellite photo. Note that a slight change in its course, I mean you're, you're starting over here in Hawaii, you wouldn't have to go at much of a different angle to you know to wind up uh, centered on the Sacramento, Sacramento River watershed uh, at Shasta Reservoir or the Feather River watershed and uh, at where Lake Orville is or the American River watershed. Um, and it makes a difference on which watershed a storm like this uh, centers over because those watersheds have different characteristics. Uh, 1986, the storm centered over the American River watershed. 1997, it centered over the Feather River watershed. Okay, we're at the last slide, but I got lots of things to say here. Um, I learned early in my 33-year flood management career that in an average flood season, we could expect five or six big storms. We didn't call them atmospheric rivers then. If we got two or three less big storms during the flood season, we would likely have a dry year. If we got two or three more big storms during the flood season, we were wet. We could handle more big storms than the average if they came at two or three week intervals during December through March allowing the multi-purpose reservoirs time to drain down and restore their reserved flood capacity. This happened in 1983, which was a really wet year with a huge snowpack, but the big storms spread out over the entire flood season, so we didn't have major flooding. 
the opposite happened in 2017, where we got several big storms almost in a row in January and February 2017. Now, what causes big problems for flood managers is the warm storms, where the snow level is 8,000 feet or higher, results in more precipitation as rain and less as slow. Climate change equals more warm storms. So it's going to be it create more issues for flood managers because what we really like the cool storms, where you get you get some runoff out of it, but a good part of the precipitation gets held up in the snowpack, which is really our, our, one of our, our biggest reservoirs, uh, the snowpack, uh, and that is also helpful for water supply. So there's a lot of issues associated with climate change, global warming, and, and, and how the character of these storms could change. Uh, that's what I have for you today, and uh, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, George. Um, I've got a couple questions coming into the chat, but I actually want to ask one or two questions of my own first. Um, you, you kind of alluded to this briefly, just as I'd um, written out my question. It seems like the weirs and the levees predate the reservoirs. Is that because we didn't have the engineering technology to build these reservoirs, or um, do, is there a reason that we went first to the weirs and the levees? Well, it's just kind of the order, the the way things happened. Um, you know, back at the turn of the century, there was and, and, and funding, of course, is always an issue. Mm -hmm. But uh, they, the, the the people at the time, they were they were focused on on doing levees. In fact, there was there was levee wars in the, in the late 1800s where. Uh -huh local entities would build up a levee on one side of the river and then others would come along uh, later. That, that, those things are well detailed in, uh, in Robert Kelly's uh, book, Battling the Inland Sea. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, so the project that was authorized was, was a levee and bypass project, which was a major achievement at the time to, to, to get that on the books and get that going. So the multi-purpose reservoirs, they were, Shasta, for example, is a, is a federal project from US, US Bureau of Reclamation, as is Folsom. And, uh, so they were they were authorized according to the regular processes where uh, you know ir irrigation was uh, uh, needed more and more in California. So, so those projects uh, were authorized. Over Shasta was built in 1945, and Folsom in 1956 was completed, and then the State Water Project came along uh, in 1960, and then of course uh, Orville Reservoir is, the, is is key for that. So uh, it was kind of a, a a, a good, uh, I wouldn't call it a happenstance, but it's a, it's a good sequence of events that took place because by having the multi-purpose reservoirs, they have water supply function, a, a recreation function, and mm -hmm. other uh, functions, but they have reserved flood storage capacity that has to be kept in the wintertime. And, uh, and it's, it's operated according to a Corps of Engineers criteria, the flood control space. So as, as you fill that space, then you need to evacuate that space as quickly as you reasonably can afterwards so you can prepare for the next storm. So it improved the effectiveness of the system. Got it. Okay, so kind of based on what we needed at the, at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a question. Without all of these levees and reservoirs, would Sacramento actually be a lake? I mean, we've got we've got the, the historic drawing here behind well, me. Well, every, every now and then it, it, it would be. I mean, it's uh, mm -hmm. it, it's said that because we're at the confluence of two major rivers, I mean, it's uh, it, it's, it's it's always going to be a continuing flood threat. I mean, it, the people have been doing a good job trying to get additional flood protection in Sacramento, but there's always a always a bigger one out there. But it's uh, it, it's it's going to be a, a, a constant threat whenever you're at the confluence of two major rivers, like St. Louis. They're at the confluence of the Missouri and the Mississippi rivers. Right. And uh, in, any time you have that kind of a situation. Got it. So it wouldn't be a permanent lake, but we would have definitely more more flooding without this infrastructure. In place. Well, just 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 remember back to that slide I showed about how things looked in 1850 or in in those mm -hmm. uh, historic flood basins. Got it. Because uh, Mother Nature doesn't care; it wants wants to go back to that, <laughs> so we have to keep that in mind. And another question about the the construction. Um, you said that as much earth was moved for the Yolo bypass system as was moved for the Panama Canal. Was that was that correct, or was it for the whole? Well, it was. Uh, here, here's the thing. It was um, uh, when you have the Yolo Basin. Well, there, there there's a reason that that was all that water was being, especially at that end, being held in the basin because the water uh, couldn't uh, it couldn't escape into the into the river. So if you're going to have a bypass system that was going to carry all that water past Sacramento and also get it out into the Delta and out to the Pacific Ocean, 
um, they, they had to remove a lot of material. You know, it, it was a huge excavation that they had to do. And just think of the type of equipment they had in, uh, in 1913 through 1924, it did not mm -hmm. go very, very fast. But, um, so I, I've heard that many times in, in, in many areas that it was uh, more, uh, there was much dirt as the Panama Canal was built. But I actually looked up the Pan Panama Canal and they, they moved something like uh, 280 million cubic yards of material for the, mm -hmm. uh, for the Panama Canal. I, yeah. I have no clue how many cubic yards was done for the big cut, but uh, anyway, it was hundreds of millions of cubic yards, a lot. Okay. So that's what you gotta do first. You, you had to open that up or else anything you did upstream would not have, have been affected. Got it, All right. And you, you also mentioned at one point um, the other partners that are, are working on that. I think you mentioned the Army Corps of Engineers, the Central Valley Flood Protection Board, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, the, the Central Valley Flood Protection Board. I mean, they were originally established as the Reclamation Board in 1911. Mm -hmm. You know, so you had the Jackson mm -hmm. Plan in 1910 that actually uh, got the, uh, the you know, defined the, the project as we as we know it now. And Reclamation Board was formed in 1911 to be the state entity that would work with the federal government to make that happen. In 1917, you actually got the congressional authorization. And then in uh, in 2008, the Reclamation Board's name was was changed to uh, a Central Oil for Protection Board, along with some other uh, legislative changes. So they're they're the official uh, sponsor, the state sponsor with the Corps of Engineers. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, there's another name for the board. They they are the they, they hold the 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 lands of the Sacramento River Flood Control Project. They, they hold the title for that under the, the name of the Sacramento and San Joaquin Drainage District, which is their their real estate. Uh, entity. So there's a, there sounds like there's a lot of lot of parties, state, federal, also local parties involved. Yeah, with, and then and of course the Department of Water Resources. We we're, we're uh, work uh, hand in hand uh, with, with the, the Corps of Engineers on, on planning and designing the projects and, and, and seeking funding for them. So there's uh, uh, yeah, a, a lot of uh, cooperation among state, federal, and local agencies to, to make all this happen. Okay, well, we're almost out of time, but I do have one final question for you. Um, in the, the map you showed, there was the Sacramento River coming down, and then we had the, the Yolo Bypass, and then there was the Sacramento River Deep Water Ship Channel. Does that fit into the, the flood control um, project as well, or is that completely separate? Well, it, it, it doesn't at this time. It, it's, a, it's a navigation channel, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, it's not used anymore because uh, they, they, they don't have... Uh, navigation up to the uh, Port of Sacramento. I, I'm not sure exactly what the status of it is, but it's uh, they, they haven't had uh, shipping in there for a long time, it's my understanding. Mm -hmm. Now, the ship channel conceivably could be uh, could be used to provide additional flood conveyance, but it's something that would have to be studied a lot, and there's uh, a lot of things that would happen as far as uh, authorization for it and the ownership of it. But, it's, uh, but it, it, as it sits right now, it, it is not related to uh, uh, the, the flood system, but certainly it is uh, something that if, uh, possibly it could be used as conveyance someday. It could have a multi-purpose instead of a single purpose. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, George. Um, I think we've probably only tapped a small part of the, the information that you have um, about floods and, and the flood systems in the central um, Valley. And I really appreciate you coming and sharing your time with us. And I appreciate everybody who joined us from home today, um, joining us as well. So this is the first part of a four-part series we're doing on floods. And we will be joined next week by um, the current chief of the flood management division. So George was the two-time past chief and we'll be joined by the current chief next week. Uh, yeah, I, I, need, I need to correct that. Oh. <laughs> the, the the current chief of the division of flood management is, is Jeremy Eric. Oh, okay. I just and, I just uh, gave Mike uh, a promotion. Mike huh? Mearswell. He's he's a, a very important person in the division. He's head of our floodplain management office, and uh, um, but uh, I, I want to make sure he's Jeremy got to do. <laughs> okay. Well, and, I and, and I I, I, I want to tell you that the, the time I spent as division chief of flood management was absolutely the most. Uh, enjoyable and rewarding work that I've, I've ever had in, uh, in my entire career. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's one of the reasons that 11 years later, I'm still uh, 
working as a retired annuitant to, to, annuitant to help out. They're great people doing great work. You know, I'm going to throw one more question before I finish up with this. Which which was the most memorable flood you responded to in the the years that you were there? Oh, without a doubt, '97. Um, just to give one example of the scale, I, I spent about, about 15 days where I was on the job at least uh, 15 or 16 hours a day. I mean, it was that. Wow. I, I'm probably not really smart to do that, but you, you get caught up in it at the time and you just got to do what you got to do. And that, and that wasn't unique. There was an awful lot of people that were uh, putting in a lot of effort. But that, yeah. uh, that, that was intense. That was very, very intense. You, you get into those, those crisis situations and emergency situations and you just, you respond. Well, one of our uh, old time flood fighters, Don Yeoman, um, he was uh, amazing. And uh, he always said that, you know, you, you're out there, you're never going to have as much information you want, but you've got to make a decision because if you don't make a decision, that's a decision. So you've got to go with uh, everything that you, the information you got available and uh, give it your best shot. Awesome. Well, you are getting a lot of really um, great comments um, in the comments section, George, and maybe we'll see if we can bring you back again and, and get some more stories from you if you're willing. Um, uh -oh. But next week, we are going to have another speaker with us um, talking about floods, monster storms, a little bit more about atmospheric rivers, and um, some of the additional infrastructure that we have available to help reduce our flood risk. Um, so we will be back next Wednesday at 1.30. If you'd like to find out more about flood management in California, you can always visit our webpage, water.ca.gov. Uh, we have water education materials, some of which address flooding as well as flood preparedness for you and your families. All of these are free, you can order them because Flood Preparedness Week is coming up at the end of the month. And we also have a, a webpage specifically for Flood Preparedness Week, which I encourage you to, to visit. Um, so there's a lot of information online and, um, you know, we encourage you and your families to be flood ready because um, as George has, you know, started to demonstrate and our other speakers in this series, we'll, we'll talk about more. Um, flooding is a part of California and as George said, regardless of how much we build up and what we put into place, those floodwaters are going to try and go back to where they, they think they should be. Um, so thank you again, George. Thank you everyone for joining us and we hope to see you here again next week. Bye-bye.